This is California Highway 38, rising up the west slope of the San Bernardino Mountains toward Mount San Gregorio. 38 crosses over Onyx Summit and down into Big Bear, but on this trip I will be stopping off at the 7,000 foot level on the west slope near Angeles Oaks to stay for a week or so in my truck camper at East Flats, just down the road from Jenks Lake. Hello, I'm James Land. You may be familiar with other videos in my YouTube playlists, including those for the books Yangshan and Chizhuo Gain. This is my first attempt at a video log, in this case of an excursion in my 1985 truck camper into some of the high mountains here in Southern California. I've been trying to get away from this all summer, but have been held up by work for volunteer work for the state park. This video log will not be unlike others people make about their truck campers. I do hope to include aspects personal to some of my experience, not usually logged. So, here we go. Our area of interest is in the southern part of California, east of Los Angeles and north of the Salton Sea. The high mountains here separate the Pacific Coast and Mojave Desert, and resorts like Big Bear are a long popular getaway from the desert heat. My camping location is not far from Desert Hot Springs, about an hour and a half drive of 65 miles east on I-10 to Yucaipa, then north on Highway 38. This high country is a quick retreat from temperatures that can reach 120 degrees in the shade on the desert floor. Our campsite will be about five and a half miles northwest from the 11,503 foot summit of Mount San Gorgonio, which is the highest peak in Southern California. It's late in the season for camping in the high mountains at 7,000 feet. The mild summer temperatures are turning cool. However, the weather underground forecast for the coming week says that daytime highs will be in the 60s and 70s and the skies will be clear. An ominous portent for this outing occurred almost immediately when I stopped my truck at the side of Dillon Road to secure the flapping battery compartment door and heard a thunderous crash immediately behind me and saw an SUV sail across the road and roll up against a power pole, causing white-hot bolts of shooting arcs and flashing sparks. The SUV had plowed into the rear end of a Burtek trash truck, stopped to make a left turn and ricocheted across the oncoming lane. As the dust settled and I dragged my walker out of the truck and hobbled across the road to offer help, one after another of six people squeezed through the windows, hit the ground, and scrambled away from the wreck. Everyone made it out safe with only scratches. A couple of them flagged down a passing car and hitched a ride away from the accident, perhaps to avoid the police. After a fire truck arrived about five minutes later, I hitched up my skirts and resumed my trek, wondering if anything worse was going to happen. The drive up Highway 38 passed without mishap, and we arrived at East Flats and selected a sunny location surrounded by ponderosa pine, oak, and cedar to settle into. There was only one other car camped on the flats, maybe a quarter mile away. So the distant low hum of a vehicle now and then on Jenks Lake Road was the only people sound. The forest was quiet too, with only the occasional whisper of breeze in the treetops and fitful squawk of crested stellar jays. This location slopes from north to south, so to level out, we dug a foxhole under each of the north-facing passenger side tires and drove up onto blocks under the south-facing driver side tires. The campground itself slopes down northwest from San Gorgonio Peak toward Jenks Lake. This location uh, has pretty much open sky from 11.30 to um, 4 or 5 in the afternoon. The sun doesn't go down until it gets into that little notch there. So the four or five hours of sunlight was adequate for our solar panel to keep the battery at full charge. This 100 watt 12 volt monocrystalline panel is called suitcase solar because it folds into half the size you see shown in this image and fits into the zippered case uh, leaning against the back of the panel here. The manufacturer is Renergy Solar, located in San Bernardino, California, and the 100-watt panel 
can be had for about $230. One real advantage of this portable model is by shifting his position every hour or so, the sun can be closely tracked across the sky, helping the panel work at maximum efficiency. The solar panel keeps enough juice in the battery to run all the appliances, lights, water pump, furnace, as well as run the laptop for much of the day and watch a movie with dinner. Setup is pretty simple and the panel is not too heavy to handle. The unit comes with a charge controller that prevents the panel from overcharging the battery. The controller is just visible, suspended from the back side of the panel. The connectors are the MC4 variety that connect positive and negative wires separately to ensure correct polarity. The solar panel wiring is connected directly to the coach battery, a group 29 deep cycle wet cell battery rated at about 115 amp hours. Large alligator clips, color coded red and black and rubber insulated, attach directly to the battery terminals. There's just enough room in this battery compartment to get the clips inside. Each morning we were greeted through our rear window by sunlight filtered through pine branches. We are parked pointing west, so sunrise is behind us, sunset is ahead of us. The solar panel is on our south side where it gets full sun, and our refrigerator is in the shade on the north side, which helps keep it cool. The first morning ritual is making coffee. If having homebrew cappuccino, we just heat a cup or two of water in a kettle on the range top, using as little propane gas as possible, which is another boondocking thing that allows us to stay out camping longer. If having black coffee, we use a Melita pour-over carafe. We filter the camper's tap water through a Brita 5-cup pitcher that fits inside the refrigerator door. This old camper's water tank doesn't hold more than about 15 gallons without overflowing onto the linoleum floor. The coffee made, we are then ready to watch the sunrise through the rear window and open door. We begin the second morning ritual by transferring our coffee and juice to the cutting board staging area and then stretching over the dinette table to the backpack to fetch our medications. They are a comely array, a rainbow coalition of capsules, which we engorge daily to win the approbation of our cardiologist, VA primary doc, and various nutritionists. We are even so conscientious as to travel with a tiny blue tablet guillotine, which we use to discourage revolution among the peasant pills. They are always very quiet. Another daily task which we can carry out, even when in the camper, is monitoring our weight and blood pressure. We have this little portable device here, and we record the results um, in this spreadsheet, which uh, our uh, cardiologist appreciates very much. Before revving up for the day, let's pass a few quiet moments gazing out at the forest just beyond our window. So here begins the tour of the inside of this uh, 1985 Lance model 300, eight and a half foot long truck camper. Dinette it comes with a table that slides in and out and turns so that we have uh, more room here on this side to sit down. Underneath there is the furnace, so when it's on, it's blowing on your feet. The, uh, we carry a small uh, radio DVD player, and most of the time when we're not so far out that we're not able to catch uh, the news on a uh, coast station 
from here we get our KRCW in Santa Monica. Not that they're all that enthusiastic about hearing the news, but we try to keep up and not be out of it for a week. The uh, books that we brought along for, uh, you have to excuse the jerkiness, that's me just limping around for uh, this week are Reportable Malcolm Colley and Montalve, uh, uh, the third book in Durrell's The Alexander Quartet. And we're rereading Somerset Mom's The Razor's Edge. We bring along a box of DVD, or not DVD, CD, CD music, in order to have that when uh, we can use the power. Uh, we're unplugged right now because the, uh, that's where it goes up there. Uh, we uh, took the batteries down halfway last night and we're only able to get the uh, solar panel charging this morning by 11.30. Uh, that should go until 4 or 5. So it's not much of a charge, but uh, once it's going and the battery gets back up, then we'll start using our devices. There's a fan in there that uh, we use to put on the refrigerator when the ambient temperature outside is extraordinarily high, like 100 degrees. The uh, small rack here, which I'm equipped with um, some Chinese learning materials. There's strange stories from the Chinese studio. Uh, the Al and uh, here it is on, on a CD. Here's our one of our Chinese dictionaries, a little electronic guide. And so then the thermos is control, controlled by this thermostat. Um, all these uh, cushions were redone by the previous owner just before he uh, sold it to us. So here we have a, what, three and a half or four and a half cubic foot refrigerator. There's a lock on the top there. And a refreezer section in the top. In which today we are carrying frozen salmon and uh, pot stickers. And we have one orange juice left. And butter and partisan cheese and free beers for the pot stickers. And OJ and uh, this is the uh, Junex Guava Nectar. The, uh, there's some milk down there at the bottom, a leaky guy. Here's our water filter, which uh, we use constantly. Um, and a few other condiments of one sort or another. The uh, Chinese chili pepper sauce for pot stickers and mashed garlic for pot stickers. This thing uh, performs poorly and when ambient temperatures are very high, uh, above 90. And, um, but up here, things are quite cool, so uh, it's been having a, a gay old time. The temperature is at the coldest it's ever been. There we go, there it is. Um, usually it's over in the red all the time, but now it's just, um, um, has not quite reached the red. That's pretty good. We have a pantry for non-perishables. It's located under one of the bench seats in a cardboard box. For this trip, we've stuffed it with Chinese condiments, powdered potatoes, flavored oatmeal, and already cooked Uncle Ben's ready rice and Gorilla ready pasta. They are supposed to be microwave food, but we just warm them in a frying pan. There are the old sourdough prospector standbys like pork and beans which we would never eat except on a camping trip. Brown sugar and hickory baked beans and canned solid white tuna. One dollar packages of Bisquick pancake mix are easier than by the box. We used to leave boxes of flour, rice, and powdered potatoes in the pantry between trips until we started finding weevils in them. Seems that weevil eggs are packed into the dry goods at the factory and after enough time, they hatch into the food. One of our modifications for uh, Handicapped is this grab bar. 
that uh, helps us get up into the into the rig. Um, there are there's an extra blanket and uh, there's a speaker up in the corner, but uh, the radio uh, was removed and hasn't been replaced. The, uh, during the day, the uh, loft bunk is used for storing things, keep them off of the dinette. Um, and uh, for sleeping, uh, we have uh, zipped together two mummy bags. The clutter of bags, clothes, extra blankets, and whatever else above in the loft resettles down below onto the dinette benches when it comes time to climb up into the loft to sleep. The, uh, let's see, it came with a monitor, which I can only use on when I'm on shore power. Uh, the power panel here uh, doesn't really do a whole lot, but it does control the water. And so you can hear the, the pump um, coming to life when you switch it on. So you switch it off to keep the, to save power. The, um, there's some storage up here, yeah. and we have, some, we have a hanging glass rack, and one of the two sinks is given over to a dryer, dish dryer, which is storage, used for storage. Another near useless appliance is the microwave. It's a classy model, complete with turntable, but it needs shore power to run, or a very large towable generator. A microwave and a flat screen monitor are fine help meets to have on board. But for dogged boondockers, they amount to little more than vestigial appendages. My truck camper's wisdom teeth and tailbone. It does have an oven, but it doesn't work. The, uh, I'm told that we need to replace this thermostat. However, it's a 1985 model, so um, there aren't any thermostats available. Uh, additional storage down here, pots and pans and trash and stuff. And there's a water pump. here with all the fuses and stuff in it. Early on we found that the converter located behind this fuse panel was not charging the house battery and that an external battery charger attached to the terminals was the only alternative. Eventually the old converter was replaced with an upgrade that does charge the house battery. Here's our uh, clothing cabinet. The, um, and we carry a change of clothes for uh, winter. This is our cutting board, which is used uh, also as a uh, staging place for cups and glasses and so forth, because I think I've already shown you this thing is not very, this table is not very stable. Imagine the fate of a full glass of liquid set down upon this wriggly table. So our cutting board serves as a staging area. Can't be getting into it, but look on it. So you put them here and then uh, take them off of there once you're finally settled. Utility drawer. Uh, another utility drawer, electronics things and so forth. Oh, we're going to measure. Uh, we're just starting to get some sun now uh, on the solar panels. Are they out there over the sand? Oh, just barely. There they are. Okay, and they're in the sun now, so. Um, we were down to 12.38 this morning. Let's see what we got now. Okay, so um, that shows that the solar panel is uh, charging the, the battery now. So uh, we're on power and can start using our electronic devices. We have a 400 watt converter there, um, which uh, we can use um, when we're running, when we're, when we're powering the battery with solar. This is a DC connection for the laptop. Here is our water meter, which uh, we use to uh, measure how much water we're putting into the uh, freshwater tank, uh, which is underneath the shelf mentioned before, um, and which leaks. We removed the air conditioner, which no longer worked and couldn't be repaired, and replaced it with a simple roof vent. We nearly always boondock with no power for an air conditioner. So now we have lots more light and ventilation. Over here next to the door is another modification for the handicapped folks, me. Um, a grab bar just inside the door uh, where that helps you get back inside. It's um, mounted on a two by four bolted to the uh, 
wall of the uh, john and now of course you see we can't get the new melon open with the table swung around there so we have to move the table back into this way uh, and then we can get open there and so it's a what they call a wet mat and has a connection here that has a storage compartment here that connects you know, passes through to the um, uh, sewer hose which is uh, accessible through a port on the outside and there's also the, the plastic piping for an outdoor shower that's uh, stored away in here um, these are the cabinets of death once you open them, you have to be very careful to stay away from those corners because they will gouge you uh, mercilessly. Uh, this one especially. So you see, I do have some empty room in here, but I uh, don't quite know. Here we have a, an overhead fan. The uh, let's see if we can turn it. noisy fan. Must be something in the way. Uh, maybe it's hitting the screen. Anyway, I put that motor in there myself. The shower head is up here on this side um, and comes out of the plumbing there in the sink. And you just stand here and shower, except that it's too short for me, so I have to, if I was actually going to do it, I would have to open up the vent and stick my head through in order to be able to stand up. The uh, John is a uh, has a, uh, a lever over there to um, pass water. The bolts uh, from the 2x4 are up here. There's one. And the other one's down here, just above um, the plastic lining uh, that um, is used to uh, in the wet bath to uh, contain, contain water, contain water spray. So, um, that's all for now. Night and morning we submit to the life-threatening maneuver of getting up into and down from the loft. Climbing up, take hold of the bed rail, mount the step stool, place right foot on bench seat and pull your left foot up on to the bench seat. Hanging on to the bed rail, turn left side to the mattress, then pull your tush around and lean it against the mattress. Bend at the waist to the left and pull on the bed rail to squeeze into the tiny space between the mattress and ceiling. Raise right foot to kitchen counter, lean back and roll to the right. Push on the counter with right foot and at the same time pull on the bed rail. Raise right foot to the mattress, raise left foot to the edge of the bed and push with feet while pulling on the bed rail until properly positioned at mattress center. Sleep as best you can without rolling off the bed. Climbing down, firmly grasp the bed rail, bend your knees and move your feet around the TV screen to the edge of the bed. Then pull yourself over onto your left side. Start your feet over the edge, pull on the bed rail to lift yourself up. Place right foot on kitchen counter, then pull a mobile right leg off the kitchen counter and lift it down toward the shelf, following with your other leg. Hugging the bed rail and bend over and push chin down onto chest to clear the ceiling. Feel with the toes for the bench, roll forward while still hanging on for dear life to the bed rail. Once firmly in place on the bench, lean down and grab the kitchen counter with the right hand, grab the dinette seat back with the left hand, step down to the stool and then to the floor. Say a quick prayer of thanks for not falling. So, out we come for a look-see at the wide world outside of our claustrophobic little camper box. The bicycle rack carries my folding recliner and a small folding table. The scissor steps are attached to a simple bracket just under the door sill. They support 300 pounds and when collapsed can be lifted inside and set on the floor. The walker or rollator. I park right next to the steps where it's convenient to grab hold of the handles. The rollator makes all the difference to an old codger half crippled by arthritis, having four wheels, the rollator, and handbrakes and a weight capacity of 300 pounds. They can be found on eBay for $50 an hour. They probably never were intended for use in mountain terrain, and they do pitch, roll, and yaw a lot on uneven ground. 
Maybe I can get one with tracks. The recliner is a model commonly available at big box stores for $60 to $80 and are much kinder to lower backs than a lot of the canvas chairs sold to RVers. This recliner is in its third season. The forest here appears lush, trotted with evergreens. But just down a ways, back in from Jenks Lake Road, there are large black patches of burnt out woods left from the lake fire of June 2015. Nearly 50 square miles of forest were destroyed and flames visible 35 miles away. But the forest began to heal itself almost immediately. And just a few months later, the hard hit aspen grove nearby was already sprouting new top growth from undamaged roots and all over the watershed new life has rallied with new greenery. What follows here is going to be like an online cooking class, so if you're not interested, just skip forward to the next segment. Breakfast this morning is camper pancakes using that $1 bag of baking mix from the pantry. We have trimmed this part of the video vigorously to make it quick and painless. Measuring the amount of making mix employs the bachelor technique of dead reckoning. Put in what looks like enough of the mix and slowly add enough water, mixing as you go, to reach the right consistency. Never mind if it looks like mashed potatoes. For gourmet camper pancakes, we use only extra virgin olive oil for lubrication. Just a titch, mind you, as we are only frying lightly to get a crisp edge and not deep frying. Ignite the propane burner with your lightsaber. Adjusting the burner flame low to save gas. And while heating the pan, switch the oil up around the edges so that everything the batter touches will be virgin. Just before the oil begins to smoke, pour in your batter, carefully scraping every last speck into the pan. Fry the batter until bubbles appear on the surface. Here you see the virgin oil going to work on the edge of the pancake to make it crunchy. Now comes the real challenge, flipping the pancake. Carefully slip the spatula underneath an edge of the pancake and to the center. Lift the pancake and at the same time angle the pan beneath it and flip. After cooking the other side until it is brown, turned brown, baste the surface of the pancake with uh, what we will call butter so that it will melt while still in the pan. Ready your paper plate, set the spatula under the pancake again, lift and drag the pancake onto the paper plate. With our golden pancake brought to the table, douse it in pancake syrup. And serve. Listen for the satisfying crunch of the edge of the pancake. Also working on preparing old journals for publication. Most recently, um, I've been doing the 1996 and 1997 journals of traveling in the West uh, while writing uh, the novel Yangshan. In 2003, I made a trip to China, scouting locations for the uh, for the novel, and I've just recently picked up um, that set of notes, also the journal, the um, which is uh, remain has remained untranscribed since then. How many years is that? and uh, begun to um, move it uh, from paper to uh, to digital. For a long time I've not been able to uh, use the keyboard effectively due to arthritis in my wrists. So what I use now is um, a product called Dragon Naturally Speaking which allows you to um, read a text 
into the microphone and have it recorded. How this works um, is something like this. I'll turn on Dragon and read a, read a segment. And hopefully I'll remember to turn it off, otherwise it's going to record a conversation as well. The command, uh, wake up, is what gets it started. Wake up. Nowhere we went did I see any of the formerly ubiquitous signs of the communist regime. Few billboards proclaiming a greater China, comma. No blaring speakers ringing out political slogans, comma. Not even a single red-starred cap. The only occasional reminders that this is the PRC are the five-starred red flags here and there, period. Maybe the political presence changes with uh, venue, comma, increasing in the countryside. And go to sleep. And so I can read out now the text as uh, I read it to Dragon. So, this is the last morning, and for Grub, we're down to the bottom of the barrel. Today we're dining on cream of wheat and coffee, while our reading for this meal is T. E. Lawrence's Seven Pillars of Wisdom. His account of the British-supported native revolt in the Arabian Desert during World War I. It's being read on my little tablet, a Toshiba, and because the laptop also is a Toshiba, the tablet is called Little Toshi, and the laptop is called Big Toshi. Out our breakfast window every morning, we are greeted by the solemn, silent, evergreen forest. So, why do people pack themselves into cramped little boxes set in the back of pickup trucks and jaunt off into the never-never? Well, for some of us, my theory is that the urge originated in childhood when we threw together makeshift forts in our backyards. Our refuge from prying eyes, sanctuary, haven, and safe harbor, was scrounged from scrap wood and cardboard and anything else that came to hand. Secure inside, we contrived a world unto ourselves complete with passwords and rituals and our own adolescent aristocracy apart from the neighborhood rabble. We played endless hours of old maid and monopoly and some of us made our first groping approaches toward pubescence. These times left indelible impressions on our young minds. Imprints that rise up from the misty past and resonate when grown older we first see a truck camper, step inside and experience a vague yet comforting feeling that we have been there before. It's not easy for me, half crippled by arthritis, to live in a truck camper for seven days, climbing up the scissor steps into the rig, even with an extra grab bar for stability, and back down again, is a painful and risk-prone exertion that occurs many times each day. Clambering up into and down from the loft, the overhang, is also harrowing and hazardous. A fall would probably send me to Fiddler's Green. This time around, we loaded water tainted with the plastic taste of a garden hose that made it unpalatable and had to get by on two gallons of bottled spring water for drinking. There seemed to be problems with the suitcase solar at the start, but in any case, it's cumbersome to deploy, go out to reposition, and pack away the panels when, like everything else, I have only one hand for the ship. The other hand is keeping me upright. The first three days were quite chilly in this drafty old girl, and I fought off throat infections nightly. But even if the forest is no longer bustling with the entertaining company of frolicking jays and chipmunks, 
woodpeckers, squirrels, and rabbits that I remember from my youth, possibly because long years of drought have raised critter populations everywhere in the state. All in all, I'd still rather make the excursion than not. So if I'm still pedaling fast enough next summer, and a lily lance remains spry enough, I'll probably set out again for the high lonesome and the rich scents of the pine forest floating in the breeze. <laughs>